for joining me on this live in-ray session um, on sustainable boating made simple. Um, I'm Kate Fortnum, the um, campaign manager for the Green Blue, and I'm going to be taking you through some sustainable boating top tips. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to be um, sharing with you some um, slides to have some visuals and imagery, and I'm going to be taking you through those sustainable boating top tips. And then at the end, there's going to be an opportunity for questions and answers with myself. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to finish this particular session video. So you'll no longer see me, but don't worry, you'll get to see some amazing, beautiful pictures of dolphins and wildlife instead. Now, the Green Blue is the environmental awareness programme for the Royal Yachting Association and British Marine. The program was set up actually back in 2005, so we've been around for a while, but we aim to raise awareness of sustainable boating um, across the UK. And that includes individual boaters like yourselves, clubs, centres and marine businesses. So today I'm going to be going through some top tips with you. Um, do bear with me if there is a slight delay in um, when I'm talking and with the slides. If we do get cut off, then do bear with us. Um, hold on in there and I'm sure we'll be back. So you should be able to see a list of the sustainable top tips I'm going to go through. So we've got boating around wildlife, anchoring with care, anti-fouling, grey water and runoff. So that's very much linked to cleaning products that we might be using on board. Oils and fuels, so making sure we're preventing those drips and spills. Black water or sewage disposal, lovely subject here. And finally, watch your waste. So looking at recycling, what we can do on board to minimise litter or plastic pollution. So let's see how much we can get through, how many top tips I can share with you this evening. So, in terms of the green blue, everything that I'm going to be going through with you in this session, you will be able to find on our website. So what you'll see coming up on the screen is a kind of snapshot of our homepage. Now, in here, you can obviously see you've got you and your boat section, a club section and marine business. Um, and at the top, you've got tabs around advice and resources. So I do recommend going there for further details beyond what I'm going to be sharing with you this evening. So let's get started. So the first top tips I'm going to be giving you is around wildlife. So we enjoy going out on our boats, exploring the coastland, um, coastline, sorry, and inland waters. As you'll see from the picture here, we've got some interesting wildlife that you may have spotted whilst out on your boat. So that lovely feeling when you see dolphins riding the bow wave there on the picture. We've also got our famous bird, Yes, the puffin. And then finally, the other picture is, I don't know if anyone can guess, it is the basking shark. So actually, we have about five different species of dolphins around our coastline, believe it or not. And some of them are particularly curious, and those are the ones who like to come and approach our boats. Others, though, um, are less curious. So we need to be aware that just because we see a pod of dolphins out in, on the water, doesn't mean they'll necessarily be interested in riding the bow wave or coming to explore. So it's very important that we keep our distance. And I'm going to be sharing some best practice around what you should do if you spot wildlife in the distance or if it approaches you. Now on the right hand side here I've got a map. It looks a bit like one of my old geography lessons. Um, so lots of um, colouring around the coastline. This actually shows you all the marine protected areas around um, Scotland, um, Northern Ireland and England and Wales. And you can see pretty much most of our coastline is protected. Therefore, when we're out boating, it's generally good practice to make sure that we're doing what we can to minimise our impacts on our wildlife and protected habitats. So here are some top tips. So if you're out on the water and you spot wildlife, the first thing you've got to do is slow down. It's recommended five knots or no wake. 
because it's not just dolphins or whales, it could be birds that are um, on the surface of the water and any movement of water can disturb them and cause them to fly. And they may be hunting for um, fish, um, they may be resting after an extremely long flight, but slow down. That also allows you to think carefully about how you're going to be operating your boat and the next steps you should take. So number two, think about your direction. It's always best to keep a consistent course. Try not to do any erratic movements or change direction. Be predictable because the wildlife, they will see you and they will try and move out of your way. If you try to change course quickly, to move perhaps out of the way of one particular species that you might see in water, it might be the mother whale, but she might be with her young. And if you change the direction, there could be risk of collision. So keep on a consistent course, avoid erratic movements. Number three, keep your distance at 100 meters. That's about 300 foot. That is enough distance for most species to be able to maneuver around and also for us um, to minimize our disturbance from noise, from our engines or from us being on board. It also is important to allow an escape route. What you might find is a pod of dolphins or um, a whale close to the shoreline or seals. And of course, one boat may go and have a look, but then you may find other boats start to travel over to get a look at this beautiful wildlife. If you're in a situation like that, think twice and go, okay, there's quite a few boats here. We've got the shoreline, we've got the boats, where can that particular species escape? Does it have an escape route? Always leave a gap for it to be able to move out of the way. And to be fair, if there are a few boats viewing, that's a good indication that it's probably gonna be causing stress on that species. And it's not as visible um, to us as humans, whether they're going through that stress. One species though, the seal, you can tell whether it's getting disturbed because usually the indication is the head will go up and it will look at you. It's identified that you're nearby. As soon as that head goes up, the next move that it will probably take is um, going straight into the water off the rocky outcrop that it might be resting on because um, that's where it feels safe. It doesn't feel safe on the rocks. When it's on the rocks, it's resting, it's digesting its food. So really, really important if you see heads up, don't get any closer, move away. And finally, keep quiet. So really low voices, try and switch the engine off if you can, put it into neutral. Of course, if you're keeping your distance, that's also gonna help. But really, really low voices. Um, and if you are um, out of water, actually low voices do give an indication to the species that you're present there and they can keep an eye on where you are. The worst thing is being quiet, hiding behind a rock, and then getting closer and then coming out suddenly from behind a rock and with loud voices. That, that can cause disturbance. So there are some of my um, top tips when you're out on the water. And it, and it also applies for if species approach you on the boat, such as dolphins, keep that consistent speed. Don't change directions because you've got that risk of collision. Um, be it on their terms, if they leave your boat, don't follow. Let them make the decisions. So I've got a really good diagram now on the next slide to give you an idea of how, if you do want to go and watch wildlife, um, how you should approach and what angles. So as you can see on here, we've got a diagram with a species in the water. It could be a whale, it could be a dolphin. Um, and it's important to not approach a species from behind because that's seen as predatorial. Try and avoid approaching from the front. Again, that's seen as aggressive and that will um, cause fear in the species. If you do want to go and have a look, because when we're doing this best practice, we're not trying to say boating shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that, but it sh um, we should be allowed to view wildlife, but making sure we're doing it in a way with minimal impact. So approach coming in at a 45 degrees angle, keep that 100 meters away, so that red circle, and then I would only stay for a maximum of 15 minutes to view and then move away to prevent disturbance. So that's boating around wildlife. Next top tips, anchoring with care. 
So this is quite an important one at the moment. Actually, the Green Blue is involved in a project with Natural England um, and other partners such as the Marine Conservation Society um, and the Ocean Conservation Trust because we're looking at what are the threats to protected habitats. And an example of a protected habitat is seagrass. And along coastal waters at the moment, we've only got 10% of what was originally there. Now, it obviously went through an impact of disease um, quite a few years ago, at the beginning uh, of the 19th century, but it's been a slow recovery for its return. And now we have obviously new threats such as climate change, nutrient runoff from the land, um, which is all impacting on these particular habitats. And therefore any additional impact on them can just cause that tipping point for it not to recover and return. Um, and unfortunately, in some areas, boating activities can cause impact. You can see from the picture here, obviously anchoring, the actual anchor itself and bedding into the seabed, um, pulling up the seagrass roots. And then we've got the chain that's at um, attached to the anchor, which causes abrasion as the boat um, changes, pivots around the anchor point when the wind changes or the tide. The picture on the right here um, is, is such a good image to help us understand that chain abrasion so actually these are moorings so our traditional swinging moorings and it's a satellite image and if you go on google earth and look up saint mary's in the isles of Scilly, you can actually see that chain abrasion so do go and have a look at yourself um, obviously satellite images aren't always clear especially if um, there's not enough sunshine reflecting off um, the bottom of the seabed but i think this is a really good il illustration but what can we do so as part of the project we're working on, we're looking at advanced mooring systems. These are just mooring systems which are better than our current swinging traditional ones. So it's looking at how do we lift the chain off the seabed so it doesn't have the abrasion? How can we make the anchor itself at the bottom smaller so it's not occupying too much space? So we're trial running as part of this project different types of advanced mooring systems to see how effective they are, um, how much they work, and then we can build confidence in knowing that we can install these around our coastline. And it's great to have that because it allows us as boaters to still access these beautiful places where these habitats are, but also minimise the impact. Because the only other solution then is not to have any recreational activity or anybody visiting, be it people walking on the beach to those areas in case there's an impact. So these are great alternative solutions. So, if we are out anchoring and there isn't an advanced mooring system or a mooring that's already there, then this is what we recommend. Find out if there is seagrass there. And we know this is a big challenge at the moment, trying to find out, you know, for a boater, where do you look to know that in that anchorage that you've chosen um, or before you set out um, on your trip, is there going to be seagrass there? At the moment, the Marine Conservation Society here on number one has something called the Reality Checker. So you go online, type that into Google, and it will bring you up an online map. And then you can easily on there, um, there's a little, um, I suppose, list down the side, and you select seagrass, and it will bring up roughly where seagrass has been identified so far. So I recommend going on there to begin with but what we're doing is we're working with IMRE hence why whilst I'm on here this evening having a talk about sustainable best practice because we're really keen to get these protected areas and information into the pilotage books because we want to help boaters understand where these protected habitats are what the best practice is to adopt um, and then boaters um, on their own can decide and be educated and make that decision of this is how I'm going to anchor, this is maybe where I won't anchor, um, and, and having those alternative solutions. So, number two, when we come to anchoring, try and avoid anchoring altogether. I know we like to go into our nice little coves and bays, and it's, you know, it's an experience we love as boaters, but if we're trying to avoid a particular area that does have a protected habitat like seagrass, where nearby can you instead go into a marina um, and moor up there, use an existing mooring that might be in the bay um, because it's already there and it's already caused that damage in its area when it's been swinging. Or use existing pontoons. 
So really recommend that if you know that there's seagrass there. If there's no, none of those options in the area, then we need to look at trying to avoid the vegetation. Try and anchor away from vegetated areas. I'm saying vegetated because you're not gonna know, unless you're potentially an expert, looking over the side of your boat, if you can see uh, vegetation on the seabed, is it seagrass, is it protected? So rule of thumb, look over the side. If you can see vegetation on one of our lovely, beautiful sunny days we have in the UK, then um, try to avoid it. Think about the length of your chain as well. Will that cross over and pivot into that habitat? So just think about your pivot area, length of chain, and, and try and avoid that if possible. If you've gone on the reality checker, then you'll it'll give you a good, good idea of where these um, habitats are. But like I said, as part of the project, we're looking at trying to get sort of more accurate digital maps um, accessible for you as boaters either on your digital charts paper charts through Imray's pilotage books so we're very thankful for their support there um, to help you as boaters number four when you're anchoring really important when you're um, deciding how much chain you need is getting the chain length to the right amount and not using extra unnecessary chain so rule of thumb, obviously with the RWA courses, um, you need to be making sure that you're putting out um, four times the depth length of chain for security. And to know that how much chain you're putting out, you've either got an automatic um, um, system on your boat, which will tell you how many meters of chain you're letting out. If you don't have that, then um, it's best to mark off on your chain one meter, five meter points. So when you're on the fore deck um, and the crew is releasing the anchor, they can count the amount of meters because every extra meter added onto that chain creates an extra meter of chain pivot around the anchor, so an extra meter of seabed where that chain could potentially be rubbing on the bottom and causing damage to any habitat. So use the minimum. Don't put out extra just to be extra safe. Try and get it as accurate as you can. Deploy it slowly. So feed the anchor out from the bow, let the boat drift back and let the chain rest on the seabed. Don't um, release or deploy the anchor where the chain all bundles up on top on the seabed because as the boat drifts back, the chain essentially will be like a snake movement going across the seabed and causing abrasion as it straightens out. So try and lay it onto the seabed instead. Avoid drag. As we know, if you've been on an RWA course, try and get your refer reference points on land. Double check your boat's not dragging because if the anchor is dragging and the boat, then that's going to be ripping through the substrate on the bottom of the seabed. And if there's habitat down there, it's going to be ripping up those roots um, and it, it's difficult for these plants to regrow. They grow, regrow very slowly if we're talking about seagrass. When you come to then lift your anchor, pull the chain in slowly and move the bow towards um, the anchor and so you're just over. Ideally, have a go at using a trip line. This is something in the project I'm really keen to trial out using to see if it makes um, a difference but a trip line essentially helps the anchor to dislodge so if you've got the anchor caught on a cable for example or rope um, it allows the anchor to slip out of the substrate more easily and the thinking is if you're using a trip line then hopefully the anchor will come out of the seabed more smoothly rather than it being pulled out um, and ripping up more of that habitat so that's anchoring best practice Okay, next one, anti-foul. Prevent anti-foul paint and debris entering nearby waterways and rainwater surfaces. So it's this time of year we've pulled our boats out, or many, most of you have if you've got yachts. Um, they come out for the uh, winter season and you're probably thinking about power spraying them down and then also starting to remove the paint and possibly even starting to apply it. Or you might be waiting till the sort of March, April time to do that. But there is best practice you should be adopting. So we've got a campaign called Protect, Collect, Dispose. So if you're bringing your boat out onto shore, 
try and choose a marina that has a wash down facility. So in the picture in the top right hand corner here, this is a filtered wash down facility. You'll see a drain underneath the boat. As the boat's being power sprayed, it collects the water residue, which has antifoul in. And as we know, antifoul is toxic um, when we're talking about paint. And if we have high concentrations of that going into the water, then it's going to cause contamination and damage to our water quality and environment. So we're trying to encourage marinas to install these. Um, and on the Green Blue website, we have a new resource for you as boaters called the Environmental Facilities Map. And you can go on there and find out which marinas have a filtered washdown system, have recycling, um, have um, water refill stations to help you as boaters be more sustainable. So when you're um, removing biofouling off your boat or you're applying paint, we say put a tarpaulin underneath your boat. So you can see in the picture here, it's simple. They cost probably six pounds from Wix or um, another DIY shop. Um, place it underneath your boat where you're doing your work. It collects the biofouling onto the floor, any anti-fouling flecks of paint. Um, when you're removing, when you're applying, it can capture any drips and spills. One, it keeps the boat park nice and tidy and looking beautiful. Um, and also it stops that paint hitting the ground. So if it does rain afterwards, it doesn't cause that contaminated runoff into our um, local waterways. Try and use a vacuum sand or wet sand. Um, this allows to capture the anti foul debris um, or dust coming off instead of it going into the environment. So it might blow off into the wind, not a good idea doing it on a windy day anyway, um, but it stops it going into the environment um, and where it can cause further contamination. Try and use a roller brush and a drip tray. The roller is better than a brush because you don't get those kind of flicks of flecks of paint coming off. Obviously you will need to use a brush in some places, but try and use a roller where possible. And you can see the guy here, he's wearing his PPE gear. Well done, because you want to protect your health as well. When you come to disposing of any of items, um, anti-foul paint is hazardous waste. So you've got to dispose of it in hazardous waste legally. So ask your marina, ask your club, do they have um, hazardous waste bins? Where are they located? If they don't, you're responsible for it, take it to your local council waste facilities. And that includes anything that's contaminated like brushes, clothing, etc. So that's anti-fouling. Grey water runoff. Um, this is more really about cleaning products. So on your boat, what do you use to clean yourself, for your dishes, um, on the deck? You really want to be avoiding um, anything containing harsh chemicals. So the things to look out for, don't use phosphates. Phosphates are plant nutrients and they are found in many detergents. And it usually makes them quite alkaline, which makes it a, a good cleaner. Unfortunately, you can see in the image at the bottom here that it can promote algae growth in the water. And as that algae grows, it covers the surface of the water, blocking sunlight out. Um, preventing other species or plants growing. As that algae um, uses up all that extra phosphate and the phosphate runs out and goes back to its kind of normal level, the algae dies off. As it dies, the bacteria decomposes that algae and uses up the oxygen in the water. So we've got another problem there as we're depleting oxygen for other aquatic species. The next thing is chlorine and bleach. They are highly alkaline. Yes, if you usually wear gloves at home when you're using them. So think about if you're using them on board and they're going straight out into the water, what is that going to be doing to the environment? And if you're in a marina in an enclosed area, more often than not, there's going to be other boaters doing it at exactly the same time as you. And we're talking about concentration here. Lots of boaters doing it at the same time, causing um, an increase in, in the contamination of the water. And then finally, microplastics your face wash, your exfoliators. Have a look on the ingredients in the back. Look out for something called polyethylene and avoid it, because that will tell you it's got little little um, abrasion beads of um, microplastics in there. And same for any sort of substance you're using on board, really, um, for your boat. So it might be things that you're degreasing with as well. So 
eco-friendly. And again, on the Green Blue website, we have a business directory of products that are more sustainable and we're continually building on that. And there is a really good cleaning product provider on there that we have called EcoWorks. Um, oils and fuels, some great devices that you can use here to prevent drips and spills. First of all, get a spill kit on board. If you do have a spill, then you can absorb um, that spill off the pontoon, off your boat, um, wherever it may be on the slipway, get it cleaned up. Of course, it's hazardous waste, so you will need to put it in a hazardous waste bin. Next, a fuel collar. So this is the picture in the top um, left-hand corner. It goes on the end of a fuel nozzle. So when you're refilling your boat um, or you're um, putting oil fuel into another container, get that on the nozzle and it'll absorb any drips and spills. And you may have had that difficult situation on your boat where you've had blowback up the fuel line when the air's escaping. That will capture it, prevent it going down your boat, but also, most importantly, it won't go in the water. So get, one of, get yourself one of those. Now, in the build, we will have some oil from the engine. Um, and when we're pumping out, unfortunately, if you're on an automatic pump, you haven't got the opportunity there to check to see if there's oil in the bilge before pumping out, which will go straight out into the open water. We recommend get a bilge filter. So the picture you can see here is a filter inserted into the bilge pump line. It automatically extracts oil out and it only needs changing really um, every sort of six months. So small amounts. So this is, takes all the hassle out and all the mess of using absorbent booms, bilge socks, etc. Um, obviously, if you've got a brand new boat, you're probably going to have smaller amounts of um, oil leak. So maybe a bilge sock is fine for you. Um, the other thing we got is a super spout. Um, a super spout is something you can fix onto your sort of jerry cans or smaller containers and it helps control the flow. So the actual name of this device is Super Spout, and I'd look it up online and check out what it is. And finally, we've got something called a fuel whistle, which goes into the air vent. And as you're filling up your tank, it should whistle as the air's coming out. As your tank gets full, the whistle sound will cut off, and then you know to withdraw the, the nozzle. Because unfortunately, there are still fuel nozzles out there on pontoons that don't have automatic switch offs. So that's really helpful. Okay, so that's oil and fuel. I'm, I'm very much aware of time and we've reached this sort of 30 minute point here. So I'm just gonna whiz through the last little bits and then we'll have our, our questions. So black water sewage, recommendations here, um, use on shore toilet facilities is your first thing you're gonna do um, if, you're, if you're berthed in a marina especially. Um, install or purchase a boat with a holding tank. Now, a lot of boaters come to me and say, what's the point in installing a holding tank? There's not enough pump out facilities around the UK coastline. Why should I be doing this? You're right, there aren't enough pump out facilities and that is something that we're encouraging marinas to install and that's something else you can look up on our marine facilities directory map on our website. You can find out which marinas have pump out and that's for inland waters and coastal. Why have a holding tank? It allows you to do exactly that. Hold on to your black water until you are in a place that's either three miles offshore in line with MARPOL guidance, so that's marine pollution regulations, or away from bathing beaches, um, enclosed areas, environmentally sensitive areas. It allows you to hold on to that and then you can discharge it somewhere which it can be diluted more readily. So that's why I believe a holding tank is really, really important. And then if, you do, if you've got a holding tank, do try and locate a pump out facility. Because the more you use it, the cheaper they get, and the more the marinas know there's a demand out there for them. And then finally, we've got watch your waste. Now, this is a topic area which is being campaigned around huge amounts um, and there are lots of campaigns that you can go and support, get advice, find out how to reduce, reuse and recycle your waste. In terms of boating though, if we're talking about when we're on board, then I recommend, first of all, if we're talking about single-use plastics, refuse. Just refuse to use single-use plastics. If you've gone into um, a restaurant on shore, 
if they've got plastic straws, ask them before they even put it in your glass. No, I don't want any plastic straws. I don't want a stirrer. Um, and be proud that you're making that decision. So refuse the first thing, reduce. It's all about we're buying too much. We're buying things that we don't necessarily need. Do we have that second thought? Do you really need that? Could you get it from somewhere else? Um, which brings us on to sort of reusing. Can we reuse what somebody else may, um, may no longer use? Um, trying to reduce the amount of materialistic things that we are purchasing in the first place, avoiding anything that's got packaging on it where we possibly can um, and making those decisions. And then finally, recycling, making sure that any products that we are buying, can they be recycled um, either by local council or can somebody else you use utilize them um, and i know we're really really good at clubs and in boating in terms of you know swapping things going to boat jumbles so really recommend that on board your boat i recommend having a general waste bin and a recycling bin separate your waste again many boaters may turn around and go well there's not enough recycling on shore i get on land take it home with you use your own recycling systems ask the marina do they have recycling most of them should and if they don't by you asking they should get the idea that there is a demand and they will put it in place because they do what the customers want um, and on our again our environmental facilities map we indicate which marinas have recycling and those are the just the ones that have registered with us okay so that is a whiz stop tour um, I've gone a little bit over here on time, but I hope that's given you lots of top tips to think about. And just a reminder, on the Green Blue website, we've got information on each of these topics, a little bit more for you. And we have resources, guides, um, lots of interesting things for you to go and explore. So we're going to have um, question time now. Um, and I'm going to have a look on the comments to see what questions we may have. So someone's written a question here, um, a question, what, what will you do if you are attacked by orchids? Here in Portugal is a problem already. Um, yeah, we've um, obviously heard about this situation in Portugal um, and a as these situations happen, they are usually quite rare. Um, and this has been unusual to see orchids approaching boats. Um, there's lots of ideas around <clears throat> whether um, a particular orca in that pod um, has been disturbed by boating activity and therefore is reacting to it or sometimes they do practice um, to teach their young on how to remove dorsal fins um, off their prey so sometimes they will attack the rudders um, as examples of that but this is definitely an unusual situation but unfortunately, you have to make sure you keep yourself safe. It is nature. Um, they have a right to be there as much as we do. Um, it does come down to a sort of health and safety. Um, and, and then that will be coming away from the kind of environmental point is where we have to protect ourselves as humans. Um, but in that situation, you obviously have to let them approach and let them leave as and when. Um, and I don't recommend um, doing anything adverse to them because they may have adversely damaged your boat. So I hope that um, has answered your question. But yeah, very rare situation. Um, hi, what is the growing cycle of seagrass? So the growing cycle um, is literally millimetres per year, small millimetres. Um, it's a very slow growing species, hence why the recovery rate of them um, is important to understand because if they are damaged, we're not talking about grass on our lawn which recovers within a few weeks. It will take, you know, up to a year to grow, you know, a few centimetres um, and that's why we need to be making sure we're doing everything we can as boaters to minimise any additional threats to these amazing habitats because they are really, really important um, and they are carbon sinks um, of the ocean, um, like our rainforests on land, and they also provide habitats for our fisheries 
as well um, and supporting at least five of our top species that we as humans like to eat. Um, so they have an array of importance um, and as I said before any additional threat or anything that we can do to help as boaters we need to be looking at that. Um, next question so how receptive are you how receptive are you finding marinas and clubs to changing or upgrading their facilities? So um, we've seen a massive increase in uh, marinas and clubs really wanting to get on board and make changes. For example, we're having our RWA Club Conference um, webinars next week and we are delivering webinars, the Green Blue and the sustainability team at the RWA around how clubs can improve their sustainability. And we've had a, a massive interest in people wanting to attend those webinars and learn about what they can do. And I think it's because of the demand, isn't it, from the members, from customers. Um, it's, you know, seeing that they're being responsible for their actions and, in, and improving their environment. And I think that's been a general movement over the last three years, really, since Blue Planet and David Attenborough, that they're is an increased interest and of course we absolutely welcome it because we're now seeing people approaching us rather than us going to the clubs and centres and boaters and asking please be more environmentally sustainable and this is what you can do people are coming to us and demanding and wanting to know what they can do so it's really really encouraging um, obviously there are difficulties for clubs and marinas when there are costs involved and things can be difficult and things we don't expect things to all happen at once and things do have to be budgeted over a long term um, and that is all understandable and it's just making sure that we are thinking about sustainability in everything we choose and do at our venues and we are doing that um, at the RWA as well across all departments when we're thinking about when we're going to choose a venue for an event whether we're going to choose um, a provider of a particular product we're being encouraged to ensure that it's sustainably sourced source as possible um, and and that is what the marinas and clubs are starting to do so really exciting times are you involved in the wild oyster project exciting worthwhile so the wild oyster project is actually um, in connection with british marine obviously british marine is one of the green blues um, Sort of key funders so the RWA funds 50% of the Green Blue program and British Marine the reason there's an adjoining of funding there is because we felt it was important for the businesses or marine sector to connect with the end user so we can't ask the end user to be sustainable if there aren't the products services and facilities available um, but in terms of this we are supporting and promoting the um, oyster project but it's very much british marines environmental um, department who who have the connections there but absolutely we are promoting it and supporting it but we're not directly involved in terms of the green blue yeah, thank you um i think that's the end of the questions i don't think there's any more anyone wants to jot one in if not um, you can see that my email is on the bottom of the screen there info at thegreenblue.org.uk so if you do have a question please drop me an email and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible or if not go and visit the Green Blue website we have so much information here. We, we deliver lots of other webinars there's actually a whole webinar page you can find out how to support our campaigns it's all there for you you just need to go and look at it and if you find it overwhelming on how you can be more sustainable, I've given you some great tips on this session. Choose a couple of them, make a couple of changes, because if every boater does one change, two changes across the UK, across the world, it has a massive, massive difference. Um, and I've, I've always believed that um, throughout my life. One small change done by everybody makes a huge difference. Um, Okay, um, thank you very much everybody again and um, I will leave you to get back to your, your evenings. Um, so, speak to you soon. Bye.
Oh, I just seen a sorry, a quick question come in from Greg. Are you online only or do you have a network of offices? If so, how can I join? Um, Greg, really interesting point you've made there. Um, the Green Blue is based at RWA headquarters in Hamble. Um, and going forwards next year, we're going to be looking at expanding the Green Blue's outreach work because currently there's probably three of us that deliver outreach work across the UK and that's doing talks at clubs attending events, um, doing educational activities with young voters, and obviously free people for the UK isn't enough. So what we would really love to do is, I'm currently developing plans for um, a green-blue volunteer network, and next year we will be looking for um, green-blue coordinators to sit on the RA committees in each region of the UK, um, and also looking for green blue champions who may wish to um, support a group of clubs in their area they may wish to deliver a club talk support them with doing an environmental assessment of their club or just helping disseminate some of our materials so there is lots of opportunity coming up and we absolutely welcome anybody who wants to support the program and spread the word essentially so um, Greg, I'd recommend getting in contact with me and I'd be happy to find out where you're based and, and put you on our sort of potential list, essentially. Uh, where can I find information about which products such as washing up liquid um, do least harm? So obviously we can't go through every single washing up liquid product to determine which are more harmful than others, but I've given you some of the ingredients that um, I recommend you try and avoid the phosphate, chlorine, bleach, microplastics. Um, go for natural ingredients if you can. On our Green Blue Business Directory on the website, under products, we have a list of more sustainable products and we're gradually building on that. The EcoWorks is one of our product sort of um, partners that are on there um, and they have been um, come under the Marpol regulations, their cleaning products um, cause they, they use essentially enzymes to break down the dirt rather than chlorine and bleach. So it's a more natural way of breaking down the dirt. So I recommend going on there. They've got a whole range. Obviously, you've got other brands out there in the supermarket. Um, unfortunately, the Green Blue, we don't do a kind of um, analysis, detailed analysis, comparing different types of products and their degree. We can only sort of advise you on potentially what to avoid um, and then we do have our product directory um, but they are British Marine members, um, businesses that are members of British Marine who are providing more sustainable products and services that we are trying to communicate to the boat users um, as options to use. But like I say, good old water on board, um, try and avoid using products at all really is my recommendation and using products on teak decking as well. It usually degrades the silicon in between. Um, bit of elbow grease is my recommendation, but if you absolutely have to use it, try and contain the liquid, use eco-friendly products. Any more questions? Okay, all right, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much everybody um, for joining me this evening and holding on for that extra 13 minutes. Um, I, I hope you found it interesting. And again, do get in touch with me if you've got any further questions and get out there, make one change to your boating, be inspired, let's do this, let's protect our boating environment because I know as a boater, I love being out on the water and I want to continue enjoying the beautiful scenery um, that I see and that was the whole reason why I studied environmental science at university is because I grew up on the coastline, I do boating and I thought I want to protect this because I want to continue enjoying it and I hope that all of you out there will, will feel the same and yes there are challenges, there are barriers but there are things that we can do now so those things let, let's crack on and let's do it, let's, let's take some action. Thank you. Um, 
I just caught Greg. Um, Greg, uh, we we have office at the RA headquarters in Hamburg, so that's where I'm usually based um, when we're not in lockdown. And um, then the rest is through our website um, and and through connecting us through email. I hope that helps. So we're based in Hamble at RWA HQ. Um, but like I said, hopefully next year we're going to be having a national volunteer team starting to develop and in each region of England in particular um, and then in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, we're hoping to have some green blue champions in the communities, uh, boating community to raise awareness of best practice and, and, and the green blue. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, take care everybody. Bye.